Good day, church, and welcome to EBC Online for one of the last times. My name is Matt, and I get to be one of our pastors, uh, and it is my joy to bring your attention to um, the changes that are coming up in the near future. So later on in the service today, Mike is going to be continuing our series in the book of Exodus and leading us through the crossing of the Red Sea. Can't wait to hear from him. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that the, uh, the dates for us meeting together in person are now seeming more certain. So if you haven't yet already done it, put the 12th of July in your diary. That seems confidently to be the date when we will finally be able to meet together as a whole church. Uh, we will be limited still to 50 people um, per service in the building. And so um, if you're planning to come that day and you don't have kids and are able to, we, we would ask you to um, come to our evening service to help spread out the, the population. Um, but we are looking forward to a day when we are going to be in a room with our brothers and our sisters worshipping our God together. Um, it will look a little different at this point in time. It doesn't look like we'll be able to have congregational singing unless we want to have less people in the building. Um, so not everything will be exactly the same business as usual, but what it will be is face-to-face -face fellowship, and it will be listening to the Word of God preached live. And uh, look, I, could just, I couldn't be more excited. I'm looking forward to it as much as any of you will be. Um, all the usual rules will apply that we're getting used to following as a, as a society these days. If you are sick, it's not the place for you to be. Or if you are significantly at risk more so than other people, well, then you have to make wise decisions about whether or not you would like to come to a, uh, a full room of people. Um, and yet, what a wonderful day it is that we're looking forward to. So watch this space. More news to come. 12th of July. Keep that in your diaries. 9.30 a.m. or 4.30 p.m. for our services. Uh, it's also worth mentioning as well that pretty much all of our small groups are now meeting in person rather than on Zoom. Uh, I, I, it might be all of them if you are in one that's still on Zoom and I've forgotten you, I'm sorry. Um, but what that means is that we now have the opportunity to be at least fellowship, fellowshipping in, in, in our houses or in our smaller groups um, on a weekly basis already. And so if you've connected with our church during this time when we've been doing everything online and you would like to, to, to meet the people, this is a wonderful opportunity to do that. You can contact us through the Contact Us page on our website uh, and we would love to get in touch with you and help you find somewhere to plug in. Uh, yeah, just the, the last thing to mention is that it, it, it continues to be true that all of our all our offerings are collected online these days, and so if you would like to contribute to the ministry of this church, um, you can do so through electronic tithing, and we are very, very grateful for the effort that all of you have been making. As a church, you have been very generous um, and very consistent during this strange time, and oh, look, it is, um, it is humbling to be a part of such a wonderful group of worshippers. All right, worship team is going to take us into the rest of our service today, and I'll speak to you at the end. Thanks. G'day, everyone. Hope you're all doing really well. Um, let's pray, hey? Lord, we reach our hands up to heaven uh, to you, Jesus. Um, God, you're our king. We honour you. We exalt you. We idolise you, and we thank you for your goodness, Jesus. And, um, and yeah, Lord, I praise that we worship God, that we would be touched by heaven. God, that we would be transformed, that the old self, the sinful self, would be cast aside, God, and we would celebrate in this new spirit which we have. Mm. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God. This is
teacher, it's Jay here. So great to be able to say hello to you guys. Not long now until we can all reunite together. I'm reading from the CSB, Exodus chapter 14. If I mess up, that's okay. <laughs> then the Lord spoke to Moses. Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Pithoroth between Medal and the sea. You must camp in front of Baal-Zephon, facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are wandering around the land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. I will then receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am Lord. I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about the people and said, what have we done? We have released Israel from serving us. So he got his chariot ready and took his troops with him. He took 600 of the best chariots and all the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in each one. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out defiantly. The Egyptians all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his horsemen and his army chased after them and caught up with them as they camped by the sea beside Pithoroth in front of Baal-Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to take us? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. We're up to verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. As for you, lift up your staff, stretch your hand over the sea and divide it so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, I have hardened the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going in front of the Israelite forces, moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved in front, from, moved from in front of them and stood behind them. It, became, it came in between the Egyptian and Israelite forces. There was cloud and darkness. It lit up the night and neither group came near each other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land so that the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and their left. The Egyptians set out in pursuit. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea after them. During the morning watch, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian forces from the pillar of fire and cloud and threw the Egyptian forces into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve and made them drive with difficulty. Let's get away from Israel, the Egyptians said because the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. 
So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea returned to its normal depth. While the Egyptians were trying to escape from it, the Lord threw them into the sea. The water came back and covered the chariots and horsemen, plus the entire army of Pharaoh that had gone in after them into the sea. Not even one of them survived. But the Israelites had walked through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw what great power the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed in him and his servant Moses. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, look, today we are in the book of Exodus once more, of course. We're up to chapter 14 now, um, which really I think is, is the kind of the narrative climax of the book and the story so far, right? The crossing of the Red Sea. Is there a more iconic moment in the book of Exodus than the crossing of the Red Sea? Um, so I'm just going to give you the big idea right up front today, so you don't have to sit there wondering where this is going. Um, this is the big idea, okay? The crossing of the Red Sea is the moment for Israel where they moved from slavery to freedom. The Red Sea moment is that moment they moved from slavery to freedom. And it's a picture of our story too. It's, it's a prototype of our journey to freedom in Christ. If there is one Old Testament passage in the entire Bible, in the entire um, Bible that the New Testament kind of actively invites us to read as a paradigm of our own salvation in Christ, right? It's the Exodus. There's one passage, it's the Exodus. And so, um, look, this is, this is my story. This is your story as well if you're a Christian today in Christ. And, and look, this story can also be yours um, through faith in Jesus if you have yet to make that step of faith. This is the story of the whole Bible. That God sets slaves free from their bondage. So today we're going to look at this in three parts because I can't help but see things in threes. I can't. Try to stop me. You just won't be able to do it. Um, three parts. Firstly, living in chains, that the complexity of our slavery. Part two, uh, passing through the waters, how it is that we're freed from our chains. And third, the man in the middle, why, why we can be free from our chains. So living in chains, the complexity of our, our slavery, passing through the waters, how we are freed, and the man in the middle, why we can be free. And so let's dive into our passage this morning. We're going we're to pick it up, the story in uh, verse 5. It says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So Pharaoh hears the reports that the Israelites are fleeing, and he has another change of heart. Once again, his heart's been flip-flopping all over the place when it comes to the Israelites. He, he ignores the fact, at this point, that God has unleashed these ten plagues upon Egypt, and he, once more, doubles down on his insane challenge of God, and he sends his army of chariots off after Israel. Now, chariots in the ancient world, they are the armored tanks of the ancient war, uh, warcraft, right? So if you're, if you're a bunch of civilians and there are chariots coming, it's the same as if you see tanks over the hills, right? This is terrifying stuff for the Israelites. Verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Um, I'm sure you can imagine this moment in, in, in a movie that you've seen, but um, just picture with me this moment, right? Main character running away from a group of thugs. He's fleeing through the streets and he ducks down a little side alley. And as he's halfway down the side alley, he realizes this is a dead end. There's no way out. 
And as he slowly turns around, he sees the group of thugs blocking the entrance and slowly bearing their way down on him, right? This, this is the moment that Israel is facing. They have fled from Egypt and they have made it to the Red Sea. Behind them, to their backs, is ocean, is sea. In front of them is the armored tanks of the Egyptian army, and they have nowhere to run. These are, these are not warriors. These are just people, women, children, the elderly. This is, this is not an army. Nowhere to run. Verse 11. Listen to what they said to Moses. They said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Was there not enough space for us to die in Egypt that you wanted us to die out here instead? Not enough graves over there that you brought us out here instead, right? Why have you done to us? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you back in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. This is, this is the kind of, a, a kind of cognitive dissonance, right? Um, a distorted memory of what slavery really was like. Because as they're facing this army from Pharaoh, they're all, uh, all of a sudden they remember their slavery with such um, romanticism, right? It's, oh, do you remember the days when we used to be slaves and they used to beat us? Um, you know, like, wasn't that the good old days? And now look at us. Life is so hard for us here. And so they point at Moses and say, why did you rescue us from slavery? We loved being slaves, didn't we? Right? We were at least safe. Like, sure, there was the cruel labor and the, and the lack of food and the, um, the horrific treatment. But, man, it felt like a beach holiday back in Egypt. And they forget all about the craziness that they had just experienced, right? All about the, the cruelty. Um, if looks like they've forgotten about the murder of their baby boys as well, back at the start of the book. This is, this is almost like a Stockholm Syndrome type moment for the Egyptians, uh, for the Israelites, sorry, where they look back on their, on their slavery with, with some kind of fondness. But I think if we, if we think about our own lives and our own past, some, some of us do this with our pasts as well. Now, some of us, when we find the going getting tough with God, when, when faith becomes a trial, as Jesus promises us that it would become, by the way, we, we can sometimes look back on life before him when we were in slavery and we think, well, was slavery really that bad? Was it really as bad as I, as I think it was? It's, it's, it's a craziness. It's a Stockholm Syndrome type moment. And of course, it's not true. It's never better to be enslaved than it is to be free. It's never better. And so the first point um, I've called living in chains, the complexity of our slavery, because the reality is slavery is, it's actually more complicated than I think we want to make it out sometimes. Our slavery to sin can, get, can be complicated. It's got, it's got layers to it. Kind of like an onion, maybe a parfait, cake, or a shrek, you know. Um, it can have layers to it, okay? So it's not as simple as kind of just changing our, our uniform from the orange jumpsuit to a new kind of pair of freedom jeans. I don't know what the opposite of, a, of an orange jumpsuit is. Um, let's go with freedom jeans. The truth is, right, it's not as easy as just a change of uniform. Our slavery can run deep into our bones. It can leave marks. And so when Pharaoh wants his slave back, slaves back and he comes charging for his slaves, what do the people do? They, they start asking themselves the question, do I really want to be free? Is it really worth the cost of, of this trauma that I'm facing in this moment here? Um, what we're learning here is that you can take the people out of slavery, but it's a lot harder to take uh, the, the slavery out of the people, right? That their, their slavery has gone deep into their, their who they see themselves as as people. And so Tim Keller, he gives us these great categories, I think, which is helpful to think through um, what's happening here, right? He says that basically you can be objectively free and yet still 
subjectively in, in bondage. So objectively free and yet still subjectively enslaved. You can, like the Israelites in this moment, be out from underneath the yoke of slavery and yet still acting as slaves internally in their inner monologue of how they see the world, right? Objectively free, yet subjectively in bondage. Let me just start with the first one. Objectively free, right? You and I, one of the greatest blessings of the gospel that we get to experience, like the Israelites, is that we are objectively free from sin and death and Satan and the power of the law. Romans 8 verse 1, one of the, my favorite verses in the entire Bible, definitely worth committing to memory and running to in those times of doubt. Romans 8 verse 1 tells us, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Romans 6 verse 14 as well, Sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. There is an objective reality called justification that is true of the Christian, that we are set free from the power of sin. And so we're free, we're, we're free from that slavery, objectively free. The reality is there is freedom in Christ for the Christian, for those who would have it. Here's the complication. That doesn't always mean we live and, and, and experience that true freedom in our lives. Subjectively, we can, we can feel the pull back to slavery in Egypt. You know, we're, we're not slaves, but we live like we're slaves. We live enslaved in various ways. And so let me just sketch out for you three kind of ways that the Bible makes clear how we can experience freedom despite, experience slavery despite our freedom. These are three kind of types of subjective slavery we submit ourselves to even as Christians, despite our, our very real freedom. And so I think no matter where you are at with God today, as you watch this, this, um, this message, I think one or all of these will ring true in some way for you. So firstly, the first type of slavery we can still feel is we can still feel bound by our old sin nature. We can feel bound by our old sin nature. Um, the Bible teaches us that we are no longer bound by it, and yet that it still wages war on us. We still feel the pull back to sin. We still feel something's broken within us despite our freedom. Romans uh, 6 verse 12, we looked at verse 14 before, but Paul has to tell those Christians in, in Rome, he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Don't let it reign. And that, that slavery language, right? Don't submit yourself Underneath its lordship. You might be free, but don't let it re-enslave you. Don't let it reign in your life, right? Part of the difficulty, I think, here is that uh, the more we give in to sin, the easier it is to sin, the more we feel bound by it. Uh, I, I like to play guitar. I'm not hugely good, but I, I do love it. And um, when I haven't played guitar for a long time, like right now... Um, if I was to pick up a guitar now, the metal strings would like tear my fingers apart, right? Because I, I, I haven't played for a while. But the more I play over time, my fingers get stronger, the calluses build up to handle that extra stress. So also, what sin does is build up calluses on our heart. And when we build up those heart calluses, what we are doing is we are re-enslaving ourselves to the power of sin in our lives. And so this is the first type of slavery that we can, we can wrestle with. We, we, can, we can experience this despite our true freedom. The second type is we can feel the, the, the lure of slavery back to the law, back to works righteousness. Okay, this, this is what this looks like in, in, in our lives. Have you ever, uh, do you ever feel like you simply can't do enough? To please God? Do you ever feel like you're, if, if you're not being perfect every single day, you're failing and disappointing Him? Do you ever feel um, like you need to live up to some impossible to meet standard that you would never place on anyone else, and yet you feel bound by that standard in your life? Do you ever feel crushed? 
because you know you fall short of perfection? Do you feel crushed by living up to the law? And if that's true for you, then you're not experiencing freedom, are you? You're not free. You're a slave to works righteousness. You're slave to the law. This is what happens when we think, when we feel that we can, that it's by our own performance, by our own works, by our own, own righteousness, that we find acceptance with God, that we find life, that we find happiness. We, we look to ourselves and our record. And if that's you, then you're, you're enslaving yourself to the law. And so what we have to do, if this is, if this is you, because this is certainly one of the ways I find myself enslaved, is we have, to fight, we have to fight to believe that our salvation is in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and not through our works. And so the, the, the equation of grace that we have to keep reminding ourselves and drilling, ourselves, drilling into ourselves is that Jesus, faith in Jesus, plus nothing equals everything. It's all we need. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Not like I tend to sometimes do, right? Jesus plus my own goodness equals everything. No, no, no. As soon as we add anything, we lose grace alone. It's Jesus plus nothing. But the entire book of Galatians in your New Testament is written to this exact issue. Paul tells them this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He says, if, if you've been set free, then don't go back to slavery. That's crazy. You're a free person now. Don't submit yourself to that yoke of slavery. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. So remember that freedom. The third way we can kind of submit ourselves back to slavery that God has purchased us Per, uh, the, the, from the slavery that God has rescued us out from, is slavery to idols. Slavery to different gods. Now, idols is a funny word, isn't it? Because um, some, you, you're probably thinking maybe little statues in your house where you build a little shrine and you bow down and worship this little figurine. Um, that's one type of idols, and it certainly was popular back in a, the ancient world. But really, an idol is anything that sits in the place that God rightly deserves in your life. Which means that an idol can be anything. It's anything we love more than God. An idol can include good things. In fact, I think what I believe is that most of the time, the most powerful idols in your life and in my life are good things. The problem is they're just good things that we have turned into a God thing. They've lost their place in the order of our affections and have become to us an idol. For example, maybe for you, your idol is the idol of success. This is a very popular idol in our world in 2020 today, right? Being great at what you do. Feel, feeling like people admire you and respect you because you're competent. You're, you're smart, you're, you work hard, you get paid well because everyone knows you deserve it, because you're an asset to the team. And so you crave success in the workplace. You crave the money that that brings you, the comfort that brings your life, but especially the, the, the respect that it commands. Here's the problem. What happens when you're passed over for a promotion? What happens if you don't make that that job shortlist? What if someone else gets the promotion at work, right? Instead of being a little bit disappointed, it's, it's instead crushing and there is an anger and jealousy towards the person, right? It's, it's, it's out of whack in your mind and in your heart because what has just happened is your God has been threatened, the source of your identity, your source of your happiness and joy in life and identity has been threatened. But seriously, this happens, right? What, what, what if a pandemic hits and jobs are scarce all of a sudden, right? That's just hypothetical, right? A hypothetical example there. Um, the threat of your future success doesn't just make you worried. 
it makes you terrified. It's crippling. It eats you up with anxiety. At the end of the day, what's happening is you are enslaved to the idol of, of success. You're not free. You're not free. So this is the point, okay? There is still slavery in the hearts of the Israelites. There's still slavery in the hearts of the Israelites. Despite the fact that we've been set free, objectively and truly, and from where God sits in, 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 from that purely objective standpoint, we are free from those things. We still experience the deep marks that slavery has left on us. Slavery to our sin nature, slavery to the lure of, of works righteousness and running on the treadmill of, of trying to prove ourselves through good works or the enslavement that idols bring in our lives, to, the, those demands for worship. So this is, this is the complexity of slavery for us. That we are in, that we live in chains. So point two, we're going to move into point two now. Passing through the waters. How it is we are freed. Let's uh, pick up the narrative again back in Exodus 14. The people, remember, they're, they're pointing the finger at Moses and complaining about being brought out of, out of Egypt into the desert just to die. Do you remember that, that line that we saw, right? Um, were there not enough graves back in Egypt that you brought us out here instead to die? It's a, it's a cutting, cutting, bitter remark. And here's what Moses responds. Listen to the response of Moses. Verse 13. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. And the Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. Other translations we see will say, you have only to be still. What's he saying? He's saying, stand and watch as God delivers you from this moment, from your slavery. I love how Charles Spurgeon, he, he has something to say on this moment. He says this, I, don't, I, dare, I dare say you will think it is a very easy thing to stand still, but it is one of the postures which a Christian soldier learns not without years of teaching. I find that marching and quick marching are much easier to do in God's, much easier to God's warriors than standing still. It is perhaps the first thing we learn in the drill of human armies. I'm not sure if that's still the case. Uh, but it might be. But it is, the one, it is one of the most difficult to learn under the captain of our salvation. The apostle seems to hint at this difficulty when he says, Stand fast, and having done all, stand still. To stand at ease in the midst of tribulation shows a veteran spirit, long experience, and much grace. Bit of a roundabout way of saying this, that it is much easier for us instinctively to act than it is to stand still when we're faced with tribulation. It's instinctive for us to take matters into our own hands. But here's what God is, is saying to us, that he's going to rescue the Israelites himself and us too, right? Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord you have only to be still. What God is saying to us today through this passage is that we are freed by grace, by God acting for us and on our behalf, and not through our own cunning and maneuvering in our world. Just be still and trust. Just be still and trust. And we know how the rest goes, right? God commands Moses to strike the water, Prince of Egypt style. The water goes, the, the Red Sea splits in two and they walk through on dry, dry ground, right? Some people like to argue that this was maybe just like um, you know, the, the, some like natural occurring event. But um, I think we just read this as a miracle. I think it's pretty clear, right? The sea splits in two upon, uh, upon Moses hitting a staff. 
let's just read this as a miracle, I think is the best way uh, to read it. Verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. I think that's just pure miracle, right? I don't think that's naturally occurring whatsoever. Uh, the people passed through from one bank to the other, right? While the waters close in then on the pursuing army. By the way, I hope you see this little bit of irony here, right? The ones who were drowning babies, the Hebrew babies, are now drowned themselves. But the Israelites, the people of God, those who trusted in him, those who followed his call, they passed through the waters of death and came out to freedom. True freedom that God had won for them. On the one side of the bank, on the, on the west bank, they stood trapped, they stood condemned. And on the east side of the sea, they stood as a, as a free people, liberated people. They passed from slavery to freedom. This is exactly what baptism today for us represents, right? It's this passing of, passing through the waters of freedom. There are two verses that, that show this connection for us that I'll take you to just, just briefly. The first is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. This is what Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Here he's saying there that the, 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 the Red Sea crossing was for them a baptism into Moses. And yet the Israelites, they would continue on this path of longing for, for, for slavery. And it says there that God was not pleased with them because they kept longing for slavery again. The second reference is, is Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, where we see this, what, this, this idea of baptism for the Christian. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, with, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism here, it represents a death and a resurrection. Going down into the waters and coming up to new life. More specifically, it represents our joining with with Christ in his death and his resurrection. That's what Romans 6 is teaching us. Like the Israelites, we move from one side of the sea to another. And let me say this really clearly so you don't mishear what I'm saying about baptism, right? Nowhere does the Bible teach that we are saved by our baptism. Now, baptism doesn't free us. God frees us from slavery. That would, otherwise, it would be another kind of work that we could do. No, we, we are saved by grace alone. The Bible's very clear on this. Baptism is a wonderful symbol of that joining, of that union. It's a sign of our joining with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. And so maybe I, can I just speak directly to those who uh, uh, have faith in Christ but maybe haven't been baptized yet. Today, you need to hear what, what the Bible is teaching about baptism. It's a command of Jesus. And so if Jesus is your king, this is actually part of following him. But it's also a wonderful declaration of your new status as a freed person. It's a declaration that you have joined with him in his death and have experienced the resurrection, experiencing the resurrection of Jesus in your life. So listen, if that's you and you want to get in touch, please contact one of the pastors. We'd love to talk to you about what baptism means for yourself. And if, and if you're not yet a believer, but 
you're thinking about maybe making that commitment to, to the Lord, baptism is that next step for you. Baptism is that next step for all who come to Jesus. So God says this. He says, do not fear. Stand firm and be still. And God's going to do the rest. Right? How, how are we free from slavery? Well, don't fear. Stand firm and be still and watch how God delivers you from slavery by his grace. Finally, the last, last thing we're going to look at here is uh, point number three, right? The man in the middle. Why we can be free. Not, not just how, but, but why. The why behind our freedom. While the Israelites are losing their minds and accusing Moses of finding all kinds of creative ways to ensure their misery and their destruction eventually, Moses is turning to God in prayer on their behalf. He is the man in the middle between God and the people. He's representing them to God. And so far, um, the people have been consistently unfaithful, consistently belligerent, and forgetful of God's miracles. But Moses is interceding for them still, faithfully. He stands in the gap between them and God. He stands in the gap between heaven and earth, so to speak. And God is using him to rescue the people of God that he loves, despite their unfaithfulness. And as far as middlemen go, look, he's, he's not a perfect man. Moses makes mistakes. He's a sinner like the rest of the people. We don't worship Moses. Uh, we can respect him as a man, but he's, he's not perfect. The reality is, for all of us, we need a mediator too, between us and God. We need someone to represent us to God. We need someone who can identify with us, truly identify with us. We need someone who knows what it is like to be lonely and be hungry and be betrayed by his friends and be frustrated with life and difficulty and be tired. We need someone who, who knows the pain of losing a loved one and suffering. We need someone who knows what it's like to feel abandoned and not be able to count on his mates when he needs them most. We need someone who, who, who knows what it's like to see pain and hurting in the community around him, to feel compassion for those in pain. We need, we need someone who knows what it's like uh, to be let down by his friends, to be betrayed by those closest to him, someone who knows what it's like to feel uh, to be victim of horrendous abuse, of horrendous violence. We need someone who knows what it's like to be a human in this broken world that we live in, you and I. And friends, Jesus is that mediator for us. He's lived out the full human experience. He is the man that now stands in the gap between us and God, who represents us to God. And, and, and this is this, if, if that's true, right, that means in the story of Exodus... We are the whinging Israelites. That's who we are, right? That, that, that's, who, that's us in the story. We're the ones that keep whinging about God's plan and how, it, and how we miss slavery back in Egypt and if only we could go back, right? We're not the heroes in the story is what I'm trying to say. Jesus is the hero. He is the true and better Moses, Hebrews teaches us, who leads his people through the waters to freedom. He is fully man, fully God, and fully able to represent both perfectly. And he's able to do it through dying for us. He's able to free us from our sin through his death and lead us out from under bondage to a new life. This is what he says in John 8. He says this, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the sun sets you free, you'll be free. You want to know what true freedom is? Let me show you, says Jesus. This is what freedom is. It's being free from sin and death, the power of Satan in your life. To be truly free, you need Jesus. Again, to go back to what Paul said before, right? For freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand firm and, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to slavery. Why would you want that for yourself? 
you've been set free, live out that freedom. Jesus is the reason we can cross over from the east uh, to the east bank where we can live a new kind of life in him. And so today I want to invite you into that, to start living out of your real freedom that you have in Christ. It's a freedom that he has given you. He wants it for you. He desires it for you. He wants you to walk in your new shoes. So don't go back. You've been set free by the cross. Now now it's time to live in that freedom. No longer bound by by sin and shame and guilt and, and, and the law. The burden of living up to that impossible standard. No, you've been set free from all of that. So follow him. Follow him and and live out your freedom. The Lord will fight for you. And up on that cross, he fought for you and has rescued you from slavery. So maybe for you, this means, you know what? It's actually time to to follow Jesus through the waters of baptism. That's that's something that I would so encourage you to to, to pray through and, and call you to as Jesus himself would call you to. So if that's you, get in touch. We'd love to talk more about what baptism means. Maybe for you, it's remembering what happened on the day of your baptism. That day that you, you declared that you were joining with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. And as you came up out of those waters, you were a free person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're on the east side of the bank. You're free. You're a new creation with a new life, with a new freedom. So I encourage you today to walk in that freedom that God has called you to. Leave the chains behind. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so prone to go back to slavery. Lord, we so, so need you. To show us the right way, just like you did with the Israelites, Lord. We are, I I can't trust myself with with me. I need you to guide me. Lord, I don't trust myself to not make dumb decisions, to re-enslave myself, Lord. I need your Holy Spirit to continually point me in the direction of life. So, Lord, today I pray on behalf of everyone listening, Lord they would know the call of your spirit. They'd be soft to your leading. That they would follow you into freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. So do not submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Why would we go back? Lord, we want that freedom for ourselves. We want it for others. Would you help us know what this means in our lives, in, in the various situations we're facing right now, Lord? Help us live out our freedom. Where we are not free, would we turn to you by grace and seek the freedom that you've bought for us? Would we stop pretending that we're still slaves? Lord, lead us into a new kind of life. We thank you for the for the great gift and the great symbol of baptism, that, that great, um, yeah, wonderful drama where we have experienced that that washing and that that joining with you personally for ourselves. Lord, what a blessing that is. And we thank you so much for that gift. And I pray for those listening who whom you are talking to about baptism right now. I pray that you would you would be on their hearts. You would call them. That they'd be soft to what you are calling them to. It's in the name of Jesus we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen, everyone. Hey, I'm going to hand, uh, before I hand back to, to John and Abby now for worship, I'm actually going to hand over to City of Light and Colin Buchanan, who are going to lead us in, an, in another song that they've uh, allowed us to use in our stream today. And so uh, this song we're about to hear is just beautiful in its simplicity. It's wonderful. And yeah, would you worship with me? And then, uh, and then we'll hand over to John and Abby as well. All right, thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. Jesus
Oh yeah. Thanks, Jesus. You want to lead us in a prayer as we yeah, go right now. Yeah. Um, God, we are so um, in awe and love of you, with you, Lord. We're so grateful for you, God. And um, we thank you that your word, um, <clears throat> your word just shows us who you are, Lord. Um, we thank you that you are merciful and loving, um, but truthful and, and, and wrathful, Lord. And we deserve nothing but um, your, your wrath and, and judgment, Lord. But um, because of your sweet, sweet mercy, Lord, you have saved us from our sins, Lord. And all we have to do is Amen. lay them at your feet, God. Um, so we, we pray for our week, Lord, that you would bless us, Lord, that we would come to you in everything, Lord. We would pray and worship you in everything, mm. God. And, um, yeah, just invite you into our lives, God. Uh, Amen. Amen. On to you guys. Well, thanks, team. And thank you to our God who has won for us such a, such a glorious freedom. Uh, to close our service today, why don't I read um, from Revelation chapter 1. It says this, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look forward to worshipping with you soon. Thanks.